Good morning. You know, uh, there's, there's, there's got to be some advantages and some disadvantages to whatever you're doing. Like uh, the online service has some advantages, and that is, you know, you can go to church in your pajamas, right? And you get to sit in a nice, comfortable chair. Um, so those are some advantages. Uh, you don't have to get out in the weather. I tell you, there's another advantage that we didn't know you were going to have. And that is last Sunday, um, you know, it was cold and we get to church and, and the auditorium's cold, which is normal. So we turn the heat up. But after a while, we realized, you know, it's not getting warmer and it wasn't. And what we realized is that th there's something wrong with the heaters and we could not warm up the auditorium at all. Uh, Ron Cook got right on it and has gotten uh, the parts and, and gotten it fixed. Although we were talking about maybe we would have to uh, move our service into the fellowship hall where we could heat the room. Anyway, uh, so you kind of missed that. Um, you didn't miss anything. When I got done preaching, I didn't really notice that I was cold. But when I sat down, our daughter Brianna was with us and she she grabbed my hand. She says, good grief, Dad, you're freezing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, even even Betty Beaver. Um, I, I think she's cold at the best of times. So when it really is cold, I guarantee you she's cold. Um, but we got through it just like we always get through this. And uh, anyway, I hope you're doing well. I, I, I wonder how you are doing. Um, I hope life's treating you good. Um, I ran into, I wanted just to, to read a prayer. and I'm, I guess I'll uh, use this as our prayer. Um, this is from around the 1300s uh, from England. Um, and it just says this, Oh God, through the grace of your Holy Spirit, you pour your best gift of love into the hearts of your faithful people. Grant unto us health, both of mind and body that we may love you with our whole strength, and that today we may do those things which please you to your entire satisfaction. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. God is a gardener. And, and a good gardener loves dirt. Um... And they they like the the smell of it, and they they love to get their hands in it. A, a a a good gardener will will talk to you about the joy of getting their hands in the dirt. They like uh, uh, they see it as a living thing that you partner with to produce beautiful things. Gardeners love dirt. You know, your garden is not your living room. Cleanliness is not the goal. You don't dust it. You don't vacuum it, right? What you, you need worms. You need things that rot. You need to let it lie, and you have to give it all time. So the parable that Jesus tells in Mark chapter 4 makes sense with this in mind. And let me read you just a little bit of this. When he was alone, the 12 and the others around him asked him about the parables, and he told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving, and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. And as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others like seed sown on rocky places, uh, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. And when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things comes in and chokes the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. 
You know, as I have worked on this sermon this week, uh, really as a follow-up to last week's sermon, this sermon hits so close to my heart that I cannot preach it with my usual candor. It's, it's just too personal. But what I find is that this subject is deeply personal for everyone. And that is the subject of how do you change the soil? I, I said last week, I believe that soil can change, meaning hearts. I think hearts that are hard can become soft. I also believe hearts that are soft can become hard. But I find that this subject is personal for everyone. And yet, somehow, we are able to act cold sometimes or hard-hearted about it and give matter-of-fact answers. Love for the people that we're talking about changes things, whatever you're talking about. You know, when I was uh, finishing up my Master Divinity at Abilene Christian, um, I had three days of oral exams uh, as an exit uh, from the program. And it, it was stressful and it, and it was hard and, and I had to study hard and getting ready for it. One of the days, the, the subject was divorce and remarriage and we had to present papers and, um, and then we were grilled uh, uh, we had really kind of to defend what we came up with. All right. Well, one of my major professors, I could tell, was not happy with my answers and, and actually was getting angry at me. And, and finally, he said to me, Alan, do you have divorce in your family? A and I said, well, no, not really. And he said, I didn't think so. It wasn't a compliment. He was saying to me, Alan, you, you, you sound cold and heartless. Like you, you're, you're talking in theory here. Like, you, you, like there's nobody you love in this situation. And, and I think when you throw love into the mix, it changes things. So when we're talking about changing the hearts of someone we love deeply, it's not cold hard-hearted, or matter-of-fact. We talk differently when we're talking about people we love. This is true for God for every single person in the world. And so I come back to the question, how can I get someone to love God? Obviously, society itself poses a challenge. Our culture is not pushing people to be soft-hearted toward God or to love and serve Him. It, it, it's just not. You know, uh, Andrew Root in his book, The Pastor in a Secular Age, describes society today as people metaphorically living in neighborhoods with gates and security systems that keep us safe. And to get through the gate one must pass the sacred test of today. Do you agree with me? That is the gatekeeper for our souls and for our person. Do you agree with me? So with that in mind, then how does God get entrance? The God who confronts our, tra our craziness and our unholy practices the God who offers confession and repentance its way, ways out of our self-created messes. What is he going to say when we, when we put that test to him? Do you agree with me? I don't think God's going to answer that question. And Andrew Root writes this, The buffered self is so protected behind its hedges that the power of God, while maybe acknowledged as, at some level, is unneeded. And that seems like society today. They don't need God. They don't mind a little bit of religion. They don't mind going to church a little bit. But the power of God in their lives, I think sometimes we're, we're just too busy for that. And so this, this really does affect our ability to step into people's lives 
And Andrew Rood, right, talking about pastor says, so the malaise of the pastor is compounded because though divine action is pushed out of the buffered self and the core practices like confession, preaching, and communion are relativized, there remains a longing for something more. It is that longing for something more that motivates us to consider this question at all. How do you get someone to love God? <laughs> That's the question. And you have to believe that somewhere underneath all of that protective gates and bars and, and doors and walls, underneath all of that is there is a desire for something more. And that something more is God himself. So I... I feel like there's a hundred things I could talk about today. I want to talk about four. The first one is that there are habits that are important. Sometimes Jews will say, when someone says that they don't believe in God, they will ask if they are eating kosher. You know, you're like, what does that got to do with it? But what, what they're saying is you cannot separate practices from belief and faith. The, the practices have, 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 they affect how, what you believe in, in, in what, what you're willing to open up to. So, so I would ask, I, I want to ask anybody and everybody, are you doing any of the practices that people who love God do? People who love God tend to be committed to a fellowship of people. And by that, I'm talking about church. And we have all seen how the pandemic has really hurt that. And a lot of people just stopped going. I read a report today that there, there are hundreds of thousands of children in this country that just quit going to school. And they're, they're really unaccounted for. But the same is true of the church. People got out of the habit. And it's hurting them. When people leave their faith, they often say that they miss the community or the fellowship that the church brings. Another habit, people that love God tend to spend time hearing the word of God. And I'm, I'm talking about the Bible. They, they're, they're, there's a connection be, between reading the Bible, studying the Bible, and loving God. Some... People that love God tend to spend time talking with God. And I'm talking about prayer. They also welcome God into all areas of their life. And this is consciousness. Consciousness of God. These are habits that people who love God do. Now, I'm going to say, not every Christian does all of these. But it is hard to imagine a Christian that does none of them. Second thing I want to talk about is compost. You know, compost, you know, we're going back to the garden metaphor, okay? Compost is organic materials like grass or leaves or kitchen scraps or stalks, things like that, that decompose and serve as fertilizer and conditioner for the soil. And along with all of this decomposed material, manure also helps the productivity of the soul of the soil. And what I want to say is that our lives are like this, that really some of the, the, the hardships of our life, the, the, the stuff that we really kind of wish had never happened, would never been a part of this, that has a, an ability to decompose and make our life more productive. And God is in the middle of that. Now, now to start with, Jesus lets us know, hey, this stuff is coming, all right? Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. There's going to be suffering. If you pick up your cross, you don't pick up your cross because you're going to a party. Romans 5, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. 
hardship and affliction strengthen us and we have to be able to endure or we will turn against God and abandon our faith. 2 Corinthians 4, Paul writes, For we are hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. All of this acts like compost in fertilizing our life and making us better people. Our faith is built on the back of endurance and perseverance. There has never been a person with strong faith that loved God because everything in their life went the way they wanted. Everyone becomes a person of faith and love because of the pain and hardships that come their way and expose them to the love and compassion of God. How do we lead people to this? How do we go there even ourselves? The third thing I want to talk about is the example of Acts chapter 2. Let me read you kind of the end of that chapter. You remember this is after the day of Pentecost when 3,000 people were baptized. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We see in that snapshot of what the early church was like when the, when the early church was baptizing in terms of thousands. How devoted they were to each other and how, how much they loved each other. Our love for each other has incredible beneficial benefit, but a lack of it is disastrous for people. It has the, uh, the potential to improve the soil, but also to create hard paths where there was once good soil. I'm convinced that you know what I'm talking about. We can do damage to each other. We can hurt each other. We can hurt each other's children. We can hurt each other's grandchildren. But love is what they need from us. And when they see the love of the body, the love, I'm talking about our love for each other, where we care for one another and, and are kind and forgiving and gentle with one another. That's what creates the good soil. You know, our, our two daughters, Ashley and Brianna, went to Abilene Christian University. Uh, and, and one of the scholarships they got was because I'm a preacher. And along with that scholarship, they had to attend a class called Lene. And, and, and it actually ended up being a very worthwhile class. And, and everybody that was in the scholarship was in this class. And, and they learned a lot. But they, they were in the class was a lot of kids that were, that were kids of preachers. And, and Ashley and Brianna both told me, you know, Dad, almost all of the kids that we are in there with I hate to use this strong language, but they hate their home church. That's, that hurts. They hate their home church. They're like, well, 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 why? Because of the way the church treated their father. That's, that's not right. That is, that is completely not right. I'm not saying that preachers don't need to be held accountable. I'm not saying anything like that. What I'm saying, though, is... When we don't love each other, there is a wake of damage that goes with that. You know, sort of a follow-up question to this with, with one of my daughters, I said, well, are you okay with going to church here in Waynesboro? And she said to me, yes, Dad, I, I, I like going to church there. Why? Because they love you, Dad. They love you and Mom. This is what I'm talking about. This is what Acts 2 is about. Do you, do you know that, 
that when we were when we were looking for a job, we were trying to decide. You, it, it, you know, we had some choices. Uh, where are we going to go? There, there, the thing that we noticed about this church was that y'all loved each other. And be quite honest, that's what we were looking for. And that's what we were watching for. I don't know what y'all were watching for in us. I don't know. There was probably something. I don't know what it was. But I know what we were watching for. And one of the one of the things I remember as we were in the fellowship hall, the very first morning, that, the, the Saturday morning that we were here trying out, and, and I was way over in one corner of the fellowship hall and Laura was way back in the other corner. And the, and the women were kind of gathered around Laura and they were talking to her and I would look over her, you know, to make sure, you know, are you okay? Are you okay over there? And she's like, yeah, I'm fine. I, I'm good. She could, she could already tell that these are loving women. And I could already tell these are loving men. And I do, I asked leading questions, whether you realize it or not, but that's what we were asking. Are you loving people? Because that's what we needed. And so I, I really believe that as we, we think about this, how, how, do I, how do I get someone to love God? How, how do I get soil to change? You know, the, we have to ask the question, will being around me help or hurt? And it really comes down to, do you love God? And if you love God deeply in your heart, then you will love people and you will love the people of this church and you will love the visitors that walk into this church and you will love our kids and our grandkids that walk in here and they will know it and God will be praised and soil will change. There's one final thing I want to talk about in terms of this. And that is the mystery behind soil change. Nothing will ever replace the place of God in the changing of soil. First Corinthians chapter three, Paul talks about this. He says, what after all is Apollos and what is Paul? They're only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. And that is the mystery and the power of God. Deuteronomy chapter 30 says, The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. He's talking about our love for God back in the deep in the Old Testament. And he's and he's saying that God will 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 put your hearts in such a place that you will love him. This is what I'm talking about, the mystery of God. And with this mystery in mind, OK, we must devote ourselves to prayer. This is where the active prayer that I speak about comes in. That when we're talking about people we love, we don't say prayers in passing. They're not just lighthearted little phrases that we're saying. They are deep, active prayers. So, so in gardening, I do everything I know to do. I pick all the weeds, I add organic material, I plant the seeds, I make sure they get the water they need, I keep out animals, etc. But in the end, the real mir miracle is not the things I do. The miracle is how this simple process produces all this bounty. That is God. And so I believe we need to be the people of God that would ask God, God, make me a gardener that loves the dirt. Let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for your love, your kindness, your pursuit. Thank you for not abandoning us. Thank you for not giving up on us. And God, right now, we, we just pour our hearts out to you asking, 
please don't give up on the people that we love that are struggling with their relationship with you or have no relationship with you. It is our deep desire, as we know it is your deep desire, that their hearts would soften and your word would implant in their hearts and produce a bounty. We love you, Father. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. And here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, Glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created. All for love's sake became poor. And here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. And here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Good morning, everyone. When you were a little child, did your parents or your guardian ever tell you, let me tell you something, son. I want you to tell you this one time, and I don't want you to ever forget it. Or daughter, let me tell you this one time, I don't want you to ever forget it. Well, probably you remember those things that your parents told you when you were very little. Maybe something special you did as you got older. Maybe it was a trip to Disneyland or some special event that you went to, or a concert, something that you'll never forget. Maybe it was the death of a parent, or a brother, or a sister. Truly, that's something that you'll never forget. Well, Jesus tells us to do something that we should never, ever forget, and we get the opportunity to partake of this Lord's Supper every first day of the week, as we're commanded by him, because he said, do this in remembrance of me. I'd like you to read this story from Mark chapter 14 about the Lord's Supper. And on the first day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. And whenever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher says, where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he himself will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready, and prepare for us there. And the disciples went out and came to the city and found it, just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. 
They began to be grieved and said to him, one by one, surely not I. And he said to them, it is one of the twelve, one who dips with me in the bowl. For the Son of Man is to go, just as it is written of him. But woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And while they were eating, he took some of the bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is to be shed on behalf of many. Truly I say to you, I shall never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Picture yourself at this supper, this last supper with Jesus. It would be an experience that you would never, ever forget. And by him sharing the bread and fruit of the vine, it would be an experience that you would remember as well. And as he said, do this remember of me, because the blood of Jesus cleanses us all. Let us think about those things as we protect the Lord's Supper. I will just say one prayer for the bread and for the fruit of the vine. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for loving us, for being such an awesome God and doing so much for us every single day. Father, and we thank you for telling us to remember you every first day of the week by partaking of these emblems, the bread that represents your body, and the fruit of the vine that represents the blood that you shed on the cross for each and every one of us. Father, we pray that we'll all partake of this in a manner worthy of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Folks, as we come to the conclusion of another worship service, uh, our online service, and we're so thankful that you are a part of it, because without you there would be no reason for us to even do this. So this is good for a lot of people that may be homebound. We don't know what the reasons are, what what keeps you at home, keeps you from going to church. We, we do know that we have people that are uh, <clears throat> staying at home and not coming out. And we pray, our prayer and our hope is that you're getting something from this. And <clears throat> be with us and help us to always know what, what you need. I mean, if you if there's something special that you need, let us know. We, we need to know these things. And uh, as we come to the conclusion of another, uh, another Lord's Day, another worship service, we pray that you'll be with us and keep us in your thoughts and keep us in your prayers. Now, if you would, if you bow with me, I'll close us in prayer. Our dear and loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you once more in thanks. We thank you that we have had another opportunity to be here to worship you. We thank you so much for the time that we can spend in study. And Lord, we pray that what we get here in church is not all that we get, that we extend ourselves and pick up the Bible during the week and study. So that each one of us, Lord, might be better equipped to spread the gospel and help us to always be there for each other. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins and shortcomings. And as we leave, we pray that you'll be with us and keep us safe. And keep us safe, Lord, in our, in our trip home and bring us back at the next appointed time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.